Let's try and go through everything you need to know for GCSE Physics Paper 2. We're going to be dealing with forces, momentum and moments as well, waves and magnetic fields. And you can download the PDF version of this from scienceshorts.net so you can follow along. I haven't included space and lenses in this because that's usually only for triple science people and there's quite a lot in there. So that is on a separate mind map. If you want to go to that, then click on the link in the description or the card at the end. First things first, there are two different types of measurements or variables. There are scalars and vectors. Scalars are variables that only have magnitude or bigness. That's just a number like mass, distance, speed and temperature, for example. Vectors, on the other hand, have magnitude and direction like displacement, which is the vector version of distance, velocity, which is the vector version of speed, force and momentum. Quite often we deal with vectors that are in opposite directions. In that case, one must be positive and the other negative. And regardless of what kind of vectors they are, we can always find the resultant or overall vector from lots of vectors by adding them up. And we do that by just placing them top to tail. If they're on the same line, like we just said, let's say we got something going at four meters per second, but the wind in the opposite direction is one meter per second. That means that the resultant vector is going to be plus three meters per second. If we're dealing with 2D vectors, then we need to top and tail them. Hopefully they will be at right angles to each other. And then we can use Pythagoras to find out the resultant vector. And that's just the vector that goes from beginning to the end of all the vectors topped and tailed together. And we can find vectors from angles, that's trigonometry. This is usually only for triple people and even then it doesn't crop up that much. If you've got a vector like this 10 newtons here but you want to find a component of it, that means how much of it is going vertical or horizontal for example, then we can use trig using right angle triangles or if you know my quick vectors trick, then we can just times by cos of the angle or sine of the angle, depending on which one we're trying to find. And I guess I don't know how to spell resultant, but anyway, components are always smaller than resultants. So that means we're always going to times by cos of the angle or sine of the angle. And we have all types of different forces, don't we? Thrust, lift, friction, air resistance. They're all what we call contact forces. Then we have weight, electrostatic and magnetic forces that are non-contact, for example. Weight, incidentally, is calculated by mass in kilograms times gravitational field strength g 9.81 work done is just a posh name for energy transferred by a force and that's equal to force times distance moved so e equals fd you might know it as w but i like e because it is just energy joules after all hook's law is to do with springs that's f equals ke k being the spring constant or stiffness and e being the extension don't forget that this can be a prac. So in that case, just make sure that your ruler is fixed with the zero in line with the bottom of the spring. Then we add 100 grams, say, that's usually just the hanger, and then we measure the extension, and then we increase the mass up to, say, 500 grams. And then we see what the extension is for each. And we need to make sure that our eye is in line with the spring and ruler, and we have the ruler close to the spring as well to reduce parallax error. Let's go on to motion. We have distance time graphs, and the gradient of that gives you the speed. If it's a straight diagonal line, then we have a constant speed. In my case, the gradient is increasing, so that means the velocity is increasing. If we draw a velocity time graph of this, well, we can see that speed is increasing steadily. Gradient of a velocity time graph gives you acceleration. And obviously, I shouldn't have written V, I should have written A instead. Don't worry, it's fixed on the mind map. But there's one more thing we can get. We can find the area under the graph, and that gives us the distance traveled or displacement. Newton's laws of motion, there are three of them. First law is that an object's motion remains constant if there's no external force, I should say resultant external force acting on it. In other words, no force, no acceleration. Second law is F equals MA. It tells you what happens when there is a resultant force. Of course, that means that we have acceleration. Just remember that if there's no resultant force, that doesn't necessarily mean that something's stationary. Like a skydiver at terminal velocity, there's no resultant force because the air resistance is equal and opposite to the weight, but they're still going very quickly, just at a constant speed. So first and second law are opposite to each other. Only one of them can be true in a situation. But the third law is this. To every action, that means force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. This is not the same as balanced forces. This is always true and this is always in play. If you're falling towards the earth, it doesn't matter what air resistance is doing. The point is, is that the earth is pulling you down towards it. But the third law says that actually you're also pulling the earth up. That's the difference between Newton's third law and the first two. Newton's second law is a practical. What we do is have a trolley on a track and we have a pulley with some string connecting it to some slotted masses hanging over the edge. And we have some light gates which are then attached to say a data logger that can calculate acceleration for us. And in this case, it's best to start with the maximum mass and then take the slotted masses off. But we must make sure that we put the masses 
on the trolley when we're done with them. Why? Because we need the total mass of everything being accelerated staying the same. It's not only the trolley that's being accelerated, it's also the masses themselves. So the independent variable is the weight of the slotted masses. That's equal to mg, like we said. Dependent variable is the acceleration. Controls, a few things here. Make sure we have a constant total mass, like we said. Same distance between light gates, because it's probably not gonna have constant acceleration along the track. Use the same trolley, that means it has the same mass, and also that means it'll have the same friction with the wheels. An important thing to remember is to make sure that the trolley goes through the second light gate before the masses hit the floor. Otherwise, it's gonna stop accelerating and your results will be naff. Okay, let's come on to SUVAT. That's Newton's equations of motion, different from the laws of motion. You don't need to remember these, you'll always be given them. So here they are, V equals U plus AT, S equals UT plus half AT squared. Now, if you have to use this one, and quite often you do, U will usually be zero. So that means that UT disappears, so we end up with just S equals half AT squared. The other ones, V squared equals U squared plus two AS, and S equals U plus V over two times T. Actually, that last one is basically distance equals average speed times time. So that's just speed equals distance over time in a way. And we use this for accelerating objects. If things are going a constant speed we don't need to use SUVAT but if things are getting faster or slowing down we use the SUVAT equations. So with any question that uses SUVAT we need to write down our variables we need to write down what they are equal to. Sometimes you won't be given actual numbers. Sometimes you'll be told it falls under gravity. In that case you know A is 9.8 meters per second squared and if it's a drop then that means that U the initial speed is going to be zero. S is displacement let's say you're given 10 meters here. V is final velocity let's say that we're not using that one at all and we want to find out the time. So I'll put a question mark next to that. So in this case, I want to find an equation that doesn't have V in. And the only one is, lo and behold, S equals UT plus half AT squared. U is zero, so that means UT disappears. So that means S equals half AT squared. Now we need to rearrange it to find T, make it the subject, doing it one step at a time. 2S equals AT squared, just double the whole thing. So that means that 2S divided by A equals T squared. And then we can just square root it all to find T at the end. So the time is equal to the square root of 2S over A. This is step up a notch if we have something that's thrown or fired sideways horizontally like something being thrown off a cliff for example we call it projectile motion and we do have acceleration in this case but only vertically so we use SUVAT for vertical motion but we don't use it for horizontal for horizontal we just use speed equals distance over time the only thing that's the same between horizontal and vertical is the time so sometimes you'll be asked to find out time using SUVAT and then put it into the horizontal equation to find how far it goes just be careful the speed at which something goes horizontal off a cliff is not the initial speed u for vertical SUVAT. No, u is still zero in this case because it's just moving sideways as it moves off the cliff. Momentum is equal to mv. Some people use the symbol p for momentum. You can think of momentum as being how difficult is it to stop an object. Total momentum is always conserved. So that means that total momentum in, in any collision or anything like that, equals the total momentum out. Just be careful, momentum is a vector. So we need to take into account pluses and minuses depending on which direction the object is moving. So here's a cannon and this is it before, nothing's happening, there's no momentum. That means that once it's fired, the cannonball goes one way and the cannon recoils in the other direction. There still can't be any overall momentum. How is that possible? Well, it's because they have momentum that is equal and opposite. So therefore they add up to zero. So in this specific case, we can say that mass times velocity of the cannon is equal to mass times velocity of the cannonball. The unit is kilogram meters per second. So let's say the cannonball has a momentum of plus 10 kilogram meters per second. That means the cannonball has to have minus 10. Of course, the cannon is going to have a much bigger mass, so therefore its velocity is going to be much smaller than the cannonball's. Force and momentum are very closely linked, and it's by this equation. Force is equal to momentum, or rather change in momentum, so I've just put mv here, divided by time. That means a bigger force results in a faster changing of momentum, or the other way around. Faster changing of momentum needs a bigger force. And this leads nicely on to stopping distance. Stopping distance is equal to thinking distance plus braking distance. Because when you want to stop your car, you have to lose all of your momentum. And that's thanks to the friction in the brake pads and between the wheels on the road. Let's say you're going 60 miles an hour. If you lose your momentum over a long time, then you don't really feel a big force. But if you slam on the brakes, you'll lose all your momentum in a very short time. Dividing by a very small time gives you a big force. And you know that from experience. Braking distance distance depends on weather, road or tyre condition. Your thinking distance depends on things like distractions, your tiredness, drugs, alcohol. The biggest factor of course is speed. If your speed is doubled then your thinking distance is doubled. But your braking distance doesn't double, it quadruples. And this is because you have four times as much kinetic energy. 
because EK equals half mv squared. Moments are turning forces, so a moment, also known as torque, is equal to force times distance. But that distance is distance from the force to the pivot. So here's just a seesaw example, pivot in the middle, we have a weight on one end, that's our force of 10 newtons, and it's a distance of half a meter from the pivot. So that means the moment is 10 times 0 0.5, that's five newton meters. For an object or a system like this seesaw to be in equilibrium, that means not turning, or at least not starting to turn, the sum of the clockwise moments must equal the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. This weight is a clockwise moment because if the seesaw was allowed to swing, then it would turn clockwise, wouldn't it? So to balance it, we need a weight on the other side but let's say I only have a 20 newton weight where does it need to be placed well it needs to be placed twice as close to the pivot than the other weight because we need its moment to be equal to 5 newton meters as well so 20 times 0 0.25 that does give us that 5 newton meters pressure hopefully you're up to speed with pressure on solids that's equal to force divided by area pressure in a gas is something different that usually crops up in just particles but pressure in liquids is kind of special quite often this is just for triple the unit for pressure is newtons per meter squared that's also known as pascals but if we talk about liquids like a hydraulic system that's a liquid inside of sealed pipes with pistons etc then what we find is the pressure is the same everywhere let's say the area of the piston on the left is 0.1 meter squared and it's being pushed with 50 newtons but the piston on the right has half that area. So how do we find out the force that the second piston is being pushed with? Well, we know that pressure is the same everywhere, so we can say that force divided by area for the first piston equals force divided by area for the second piston. So plugging the numbers in, we find that the force is going to be double. So it's 100 newtons. Let's go on to waves. Waves are clever because they transfer energy without transferring matter. In other words, without transferring stuff. It's just the energy gets passed along. There are two main types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. Transverse waves are your classic waves where the oscillations are perpendicular, that means 90 degrees, to the direction of energy transfer. In other words, the direction the wave is going in. Examples of this are light or any electromagnetic waves, waves on water and string, and also seismic S waves. Here's a diagram, the wave is going to the right, but the particles are going up and down. Longitudinal waves, on the other hand, the oscillations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer, like sound or seismic P waves. P stands for primary, S stands for secondary. It's harder to draw longitudinal waves, but here are some lines to represent particles. If the wave is going to the right, the particles are oscillating left to right. So we end up with places where the particles are close together, we call those compressions, and areas where they're further apart, we call those rarefactions. Seismic P waves are faster than seismic S waves. That's why they're primary and secondary. And because the Earth has a molten iron core, only P waves can go through that. S waves don't. So that's why here in the UK, we probably wouldn't feel the aftershock of an earthquake that originated in, say, Australia. Both waves, however, can be represented as a waveform. It just so happens that transverse waves do look like waveforms themselves. So on the y-axis, we have displacement. That's how far away particles are from their equilibrium or original position. We have amplitude. That's the maximum displacement of the wave. And the distance from one peak to the next or the length of one complete wave is called, lo and behold, the wavelength. Now that's only the case if the x-axis is distance. If the x-axis is time, then the distance between one peak and the next has to be a time as well. And this is called the time period. We give wavelength the Greek letter lambda and time period capital T. The definition of frequency is the number of complete waves that pass a point every second. Has the symbol F, of course, and the unit is hertz. Frequency and wavelength are linked together through the wave equation. That's V equals F lambda. Some people like C instead of V, but that's wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Quite often you'll be given a waveform like this and you can find the time period and then it'll ask you to find the frequency. You don't need anything else. Frequency is equal to one divided by the time period. They're reciprocals of one another. So there are two possible practices here. One is a ripple tank. We just have a dipper that goes up and down and makes waves in shallow water. What we do is measure the length of 10 waves and divide by 10 to get the wavelength. And you'll be given frequency by the equipment operating the dipper. And so then we can find the speed of the water waves doing V equals F lambda. All we do is change the frequency and measure the wavelength again. And what we should find is that F times lambda gives you the same number every time, showing you that the speed of the water waves is constant. But that's provided that you keep the depth of the water the same. So that's a control variable. The alternative is measuring the wavelength of a stationary wave on a piece of string. What we do is have an oscillator attached to a piece of string, string going over a pulley and then down to some slotted masses hanging over the bench. So long as the frequency is right, we have a stationary wave being made. 
And you don't really need to know this, but this is because the wave going towards the pulley gets reflected and these two waves traveling in opposite directions interfere with each other and they make this super wave. You're probably going to try and get one loop. So actually you only have half a wavelength here. So the wavelength is twice the length of the piece of string. Of course, that's from the pulley to the oscillator. Frequency again is usually given by the signal generator operating the oscillator. And then we can use the wave equation to get the speed again. Control variables are type and thickness of the string and also the mass hanging on the end. Here's the ear or electromagnetic spectrum. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. Great tune. Radio waves have the longest wavelength, gamma rays have the shortest wavelength. So that means gamma rays also have the highest frequency and that means they also have the most energy. That's why gamma rays are the most dangerous. That's why we use them to sterilize equipment or for, say, radiotherapy. Radio waves are used for communications, TV, radio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, mobile signals, microwaves. Of course, we can use those to heat up food. Incidentally, they're absorbed by water and fat molecules. Ultraviolet comes from the sun and it can cause skin cancer. So that's why we wear sunscreen. And you know that we can use x-rays to scan what's inside of our bodies. Reflection, nice and easy. Light and other waves reflect off materials at the same angle as their angle of incidence. That's the angle they hit it at. Refraction, on the other hand, when light enters a new medium, that just means a new material, it will change speed. And light travels fastest in air or a vacuum. But if it changes speed, it can also change direction. So rule of thumb is that if light goes faster, then it bends away from the normal. Slower, bends towards it. So this is a prac, get a class or a perspex block. We draw a normal, that's a line that is 90 degrees to the surface. And that's what we measure all of our angles from. So here's light going in. And so the angle between it and the normal is the angle of incidence, I. And then we can see that it's changed direction going through, and that's our angle of refraction, R. We can do this once, or we can change the angle of incidence and measure the angle of refraction every time. And what we'll find is that sine I divided by sine R should be constant every time. And this number gives us something called the refractive index. Usually we give that the letter little n. That's always gonna be bigger than one. It tells you how much slower light goes in a material compared to air or a vacuum. So the alternative equation is refractive index equals speed in vacuum divided by speed in the medium. If you've got lots of results, then we can draw a graph. Sin i on the y-axis, sin r on the x-axis, and the gradient is going to give us the refractive index n. Infrared absorption. Matte black materials are best at absorbing and emitting infrared. And we can carry out this prac to prove it. What we do is get some boiling tubes and wrap them in matte black, matte white, and shiny materials. We have a bung in each, and we have a thermometer popping out the top. What you want really is water inside these boiling tubes as well, with the bulb of the thermometer in the water. We have an infrared lamp that's the same distance away from all of them. We turn it on, and then after, say, five minutes, we record what the temperature is for each, and we'll see that the matte black has the highest temperature. All right, magnetic fields. Here's your standard bar magnet with a north and a south pole. And we can draw magnetic field lines around it. If you want to see those, we can use little compasses or iron filings, and they will line themselves up along those lines. Field lines show the direction of force on an imaginary north pole near the magnet. So that means that they go away from the north pole and towards the south pole. I haven't got that quite right on the left there. Field lines never cross and they never break. So you can see these field lines going out. Well, they are eventually going to loop back round. So we know they're going to be inside the magnet as well. We just don't usually draw them. If lines are closer together, that means you have a stronger field. So naturally, the closest together near the poles of the magnet. If we have two like poles, that means north and north or south and south, then the fuel lines will squash together and then get flung outwards because they can't touch. If we have a north and a south pole, then the fuel lines go from one to the other. Of course, they go from north to south. Magnetic field strength, or its proper name, magnetic flux density, is given the symbol capital B and the unit is capital T for Tesla. We can measure the strength of a field using the motor effect. That is, a wire with a current flowing through it will experience a force if it's in a magnetic field. And the equation for this is F bill. Force equals field strength times current times length of wire in the field. And we can measure the force by having the magnets resting on a top band balance. When we turn the circuit on, we'll see a change in mass. If we times that by G, then that gives us the force. However, if you want to find out the direction of the force, we need to use Fleming's left hand rule. So get your fingers like a gun, freeze, FBI. Thumb is force, first finger is field, second finger is current. And they're all at 90 degrees to each other. So all you have to do is get your fingers like that. Don't move your fingers, but just twist your wrist to get them in line. So in my diagram, well man, I've picked a hard one here. So my thumb ends up pointing down. The force on the wire is gonna be down. If we have a current in a coil, also known as a solenoid, then we've made an electromagnet. 
If you have a bigger current or more turns in the coil, we have a stronger field. And if you put an iron core in the middle, like a nail, that makes it stronger too. The motor effect is used for motors, unsurprisingly. A simple motor can look like this. We have a coil of wire with a current flowing through it, and we have a north and a south pole of two magnets either side. The coil must be connected to the circuit via a split ring commutator. This is to make sure that the current flips every half a turn. If this wasn't there, then the coil would just go vertical and then stop, but flipping it makes sure that it keeps going. To make a motor go faster, we can have a stronger magnetic field, a higher PD or current, and more turns in the coil. And in reality, motors have hundreds of turns. A generator or a dynamo is almost like the opposite of a motor. We turn it and it makes current. We can say that a current is induced. Here's our magnets again, and here's a coil. We don't need a commutator this time though. It just means we get AC out, but that's okay. To make the dynamo have a higher output, again, we can have a stronger field or more turns in the coil. And naturally we can just turn it faster as well. A speaker is effectively a back and forth motor. We have a coil surrounding a magnet. That magnet is connected to the paper cone of the speaker. The signal goes into the coil and it makes the magnet move back and forth. That moves the cone, making sound waves. A microphone is like the opposite to a speaker. We have a diaphragm that moves with sound waves, that moves the magnet inside of the coil and that induces a current in the wires, which then goes to your recorder or whatever. Usually just for triple, transformers are a very important part of the national grid. We have an iron core with coils of wire on either side, with the primary coil and the secondary coil. And they'll usually have different numbers of turns in the coils. So we have N1, that's turns in the primary coil, and N2, turns in the secondary coil. The core in the middle is made of soft iron and it's layered or laminated as well. And that's to make sure that there's as little energy lost inside the core as possible. And this is because we don't actually want any current inside the core itself, but we're accidentally gonna end up with a little bit. And so layering it reduces those currents. If the secondary coil has more turns than the primary, that means it will have a higher voltage or higher PD than the primary coil. So we can say that the ratio of the number of turns is equal to the ratio of the voltages. So N1 divided by N2 equals V1 divided by V2. And usually you'll be asked to find out V2 to so see if you can rearrange that. If it's 100% efficient, then that means the power going in equals the power coming out. So we can say that I times V for the primary coil equals I times V for the secondary coil. So once you've found V2 from the first equation, sometimes you'll be asked to find out the current in the secondary coil as well. Transformers are used to step up the voltage outside of a power station to reduce the energy lost as heat in the national grid due to the resistance of the overhead cables. Because if we step up the voltage, that means we have a lower current in the cables. And then of course we step it back down outside our houses to 230 volts. Transformers only work with AC. That's because AC goes into the primary coil, that's an alternating current, so that makes a changing or fluctuating magnetic field in the core. Don't forget there should be no current in the core itself. That changing magnetic field then induces a current in the secondary coil. If it was DC, it would make a magnetic field, but it wouldn't be changing. So nothing would happen in the secondary coil. So that's pretty much it. If you think that I've missed anything, then pop it in a comment down below and I'll add it to the PDF for you. If you wanna go into some more detail with this stuff, then check out my playlist which will walk you through it a little bit more slowly. If this helped you, please leave a like and good luck for your exams.